Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm the host. I'm your chief cat herder and your guide to the next hour of conversation as we collaboratively explore the future of higher education. I think pretty much everybody in the world for the past four and a half, five years has been very concerned with problems of disinformation, misinformation, bad news, fake news, and hoaxes. And over the course of the pandemic, these have become even more and more important and more urgent. The World Health Organization has referred to an infodemic that described a flood of bad information and uh, bad quality connections. So this has been a subject of a great deal of concern within academia, especially as we are devoted to truth, to both exploring it and teaching it. Uh, this is a recent book, Media Technology and Education of Post-Truth Society. Uh, that was, it's an anthology looking at this topic from multiple angles. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to have not just two of the authors, but also its editor. So I, I just want to point out, we're going to bring them up on stage one by one, Dr. Emma Paltzfor, Natalie Smolensky, and Dr. Alex Grek. Um, but let me just get this slide out of the way, and let me bring them up one by one so you can see each of them, and then we'll start our great conversation. So let's see about who we can find. There is Natalie. And let's see if we can get her up on stage. Welcome, Natalie. Hello, Brian. It's really good to see you. Welcome to the program. Yes, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Oh, great. Uh, first question to ask is, where are you today? I'm in Dallas, Texas. Is it a little cooler now or is it still blazingly hot? <laughs> it is blazing hot. I had dinner outside last night um, at a restaurant in light of, you know, COVID precautions. And I was just like sweating bullets. Like my clothes were drenched. <laughs> I'm glad you're inside in the air conditioning right now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Well, Natalie, the way we introduce people here on the program, besides saying you're wonderful, which obviously you are, uh, is to ask you what you're going to be working on for the next year. What's ahead for you? What are the big projects and what are the big ideas that are uppermost on your agenda? I love that question. Um, so I'm currently working on a book uh, with my partner on protocol revolutions and the future of political economy. So. Um, you may know that um, I have background in uh, the blockchain space. Um, mm -hmm. I've been following it very closely, um, particularly in its Bitcoin uh, incarnation. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, uh, very keen on the uh, implications that has for seeding something called digital self-sovereignty, meaning um, shifting the balance of power away from uh, centralized brokers of information and data um, to the end users. Um, so that obviously has economic implications, it has political implications, it has geopolitical implications in terms of relationships between nation states. Um, so I'm uh, going to be exploring that in this book. Fantastic. Oh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. And I think most of our guests, would, or most of our audience would be as well. Good luck. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Natalie, hang on right there for a second. Let me bring up some of your uh, fellow uh, authors and um, some of your fellow uh, your fellow editor, in fact. So, right. so you're from Texas right now. Now mm -hmm. we get to bring in Emma Ponsfort, who is coming to us from Cyprus. Hmm. Hi, Brian. Hi, Natalie. Hello, Emma. Very good to see you. So yeah, Cyprus today, normally Bath, which is less sunny, but Natalie, I can definitely <laughs> empathize with the heat. So um, thank you for scheduling when it's uh, evening, when it's a little bit cooler. Well, thank you for being able to make it in your schedule. I'm glad to see you. Um, Emma, one, let me just ask you the same question I put to Natalie, which is looking ahead to the next year, what are you gonna be working on? What are the big projects and the big ideas that are uppermost of mind? Well, the first thing I was going to say is wait for Natalie's book and, and read that avidly. Um, it sounds fascinating. So really, I suppose the next academic year is about building out some of the COVID era projects I've been really fortunate to work on, partly with Alex and other organisations at the intersection of education and technology. So one project being building out the Digital Literacy Lab for Educators that 
I developed and co-delivered with Alex's foundation in Malta and the Commonwealth of Learning over in Vancouver. So we've done two iterations of that and we've got a follow-on program which is looking to really bridge the gap between what we are understanding out of the learning sciences and education mm. and technology as well to really broaden out what we mean by digital literacy. Um, and those are educator facing programs. And um, alongside that, working on some student facing learning literacy and digital literacy programs, and also other instructional design um, projects that are looking at, again, that theme of bridging the gap between university and post university life, world of work, immersive employability projects, one in the Southwest. Uh, linking up the narratives of the climate crisis with uh, potentially mm -hmm. the engineering department over in, at the University of Cambridge. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, by night, uh, producing classical music recordings. But that's for a different different night, different topic. Whoa, how many Emma Palsforts are there? You're a one-woman army. Well, a few hats. I just changed them. There we go. <laughs> a lot of hats, a lot of work. Emma, that sounds fantastic. Um, and uh, I, I would love to nerd out with you about classical music production uh, afterwards. Um, but also, if you if you can, if you want to throw into the mm -hmm. chat a link to the uh, some of the COL projects, I'm sure people would love that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I definitely do that. So excited for you to be here. And now let's complete the troika. Let's bring up on stage the uh, book's editor, and it's Cad Herder, Alex Grek, coming to you not too far from Cyprus, from the wonderful island of Malta. Hello, Alex. Hi, Brian. Yes, I mean, it, it's hot here too, but it's completely dark. It's a bit spooky, actually, outside my window. But um, yeah, here we are, Malta, Cyprus, Dallas, wherever you are these days, um, all connected. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, uh, you know, bringing us here, I guess. Um, what shall we talk about, Brian? Well, the first oh. thing I want to ask you about is what are you going to be working on for the next year? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm teaching. Uh, I, I teach new media at the University of Malta. I teach, I guess, new media and digital literacy. So I've got about three classes, and I apparently I'm, I'm meant to be teaching at the doctorate school as well. Um, I feel a bit of a misfit sometimes in the academic world because, as you know, I I kind of crashed into academia late in my life after having done a PhD for fun. So it's it's always that kind of relationship I have with with higher education, which is why I'm kind of intrigued yes. this whole idea of you wanting to crash post truths and, uh, and higher education. Um, I also run the, the 3CL Foundation, which is a tiny foundation we, we set up here in 2016, 2017, um, using the, I guess, the, the beauty of small states as island labs, really, where you can try out crazy things, whether it's pedagogies, whether it's you know, using blockchain for, I guess, education credentials, whether it's, um, it's this is an easy place to try and get people to, to gather together pre-COVID to, for, for a Congress, for a conference, for a, you know, and I guess the exception of Emma, I guess I even managed to drag you here, Brian, a couple of times. You know, it's great, every time, every Natalie time. Been here. Um, but I guess my, my focus at the moment is, is steering some new projects for the 3CL um, teaching. I'm running some seminars, I guess, for the Asia Europe Foundation on AI. I guess my, my work these days, because it tells you how old I am, it's, it's like this whole thing. But you, know, you remember the old Nokia thing about connecting people? I mean, I'm, I'm involved in a lot of networks, I guess, you know, yes. real virtual. So I, I guess um, I'm pretty determined to deliver on this whole EdTech thing now post-COVID and see where it's going to take us. And then there's the book, I guess, which is which was fun and is a byproduct, I guess, of one of those things we did in the past. Yes, so that's how the book came about. Well, you are definitely a master networker and a master connector, and that's one of the one of the ways that this book came about. Yeah, um, friends, uh, the future transform is devoted to the questions and uh, comments that everybody in the audience has, and. Um, to lead off, we already have one, uh, and then we bring up the questioner on stage. This is Steve Cavello coming to you from New Hampshire in the United States. Hello, Steve. Hey, hey. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for making your first chapter, uh, your preview chapter, available. Uh, your timing couldn't possibly have been better. Uh, I just had a course passed through a curriculum committee called Synthetic Media and the Corrosion of Reality, and I think uh, the subject matter that you are 
describing in the essays there, I think, are certainly supportive of that topic. Uh, my question to you is this. In Dana Boyd's 2018 South by Southwest EDU keynote address, she stated in so many words that scaffolding skills in media literacy alone will not cure us as a society of our vulnerabilities to misinformation. Rather, it is the worst actors who are the best at employing their literacy towards antisocial and anti-intellectual ends. So my question to you is, do you see this as a political problem, an education problem, a corporate strategy problem, or a public health problem? Or none of the above? Wow, what a great question, Steve. Please, who wants to take a run at that? I mean, if you want me to repeat it, it's kind of like... <laughs> Oh, can, I, can I can I can I dive in for a sec? Because maybe it's 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 really about context, and it's not because I'm I'm here to peddle the book because I'm not. But I I'll take you back to where I was. They've been 2018. You know, I I kind of inter I, I just I interface between the media, technology, and education world, and I I think I had got to a space, maybe because of Trump or other things that I I. I couldn't figure out whether these things we call media, technology, and education are forces for good or making life worse. And that was my first point of departure for what do we do about it? The second thing I had done was, because I don't think there's a straight answer to your question, is, is to try and get as many different types of people in the same space, literally lock them up almost for like two days and see what comes out. So I had anything from philosophers to prosecutors, to people who build technologies, people who hate technology, uh, artists, whatever. And, and I guess the vague thing was th this tension. Of, oh, clearly there were the digital literacy people. And the other thing I wanted to do was, was you, you got all of these talking heads, I guess, was also to get young people who I think I'm more knowledgeable about this. So towards the end of this two-day conference, we actually got in about 40 young people aged between 16 and 18. I said, now you've had all of this stuff. Was all of this bullshit or, or does it resonate? Um, so my, my first answer is I, I think it's, it's complicated. I, I think I, I, this thing that I fell in love with called the internet years ago, I mean, I got to know Brian because through Howard Rheingold, because we were both hippies, I guess. And we all thought in the old days that, you know, being able to say anything you wanted, wherever you wanted, was, was really great. And now here we are 15 years ago. There, there are things that people recorded me saying 10 years ago, and I'm embarrassed about what I said in the age of, you know, platforms and, and the rest of it. So that's my first spiel back. It's not an answer. It's like it's complicated. Ladies. Thanks. Natalie, yeah, I'm happy to take up mantle. I've been busy scribbling away. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Emma, and I'll I'll follow up. Super. Well, Steve, thanks so much for the question, and and Alex for uh, warming us up and into it. I think, if I may, sort of pick up on the media literacy, the sort of terminology, and that's something very much I think all of our contributions sort of circle round is this challenge of taxonomies. And if I may. Uh, without uh, contradicting what Alex was saying about the, you know, the, the thorniness of the question and the topic at hand, is that the, you know, if we talk about media literacy, suddenly that can put off a whole load of stakeholders. So very much something that I've been thinking about for a while is what is it, what is the real problem here? Is it a definition and presentation problem, um, mm -hmm. which then will feed into uh, re-engaging uh, stakeholders at a time, and by stakeholders to uh, clarify what I mean by there is, you know, yes, grassroots activism is is, is needed, but also that top down or that government engagement and uh, commitment to really embed this. I mean, I don't want to use the word skill because then we come into what do we mean by skill and knowledge and and, and a whole other contentious debate, but. Uh, this you know, fundamental 21st century uh, practical ability, which is to uh, discern information and work your way through it. Um, and in terms of the, of the chronology, if I may pick up on what Alex was sort of outlining in terms of how the, the decades have come by, may, maybe this is the time to recapture that optimism when uh, the web first started developing 
and recognize that it, it is a very new um, form of technology. If we think the Gutenberg Press came out, you know, 15th century, and it took centuries before people really understood how to harness that technology of disseminating information. Um, so here to sort of add in a dose of optimism as, as far as I can, as we're all sort of continuing to face all these challenges, is this, you know, out of this forum, the book and elsewhere, um, our opportunity really to uh, come back to what Tim Berners-Lee is launching and uh, advocating now um, is, you know, thinking about how we define and present, how we engage and how we, basically what words we use ultimately to talk about uh, this very important area of um, ability, skill, knowledge, whatever we want to call it. Thank you, Emma. Emma uh, Natalie, do you want to add to that? Sure, yeah. No, I mean, um, one, one of the predictable and reliable effects of um, democratizing information technologies is, um, the, is that it, it predictably and reliably uh, creates the conditions for amplification anywhere and everywhere. Um, and amplification is a form of power. Um, so this, this can be wielded, you know, towards uh, what, what we might value as good ends, uh, qua, say, the Arab Spring, um, or, you know, more negative ends, like, <laughs> like ISIS using, you know, social media to, to source recruits from all over the world. Um, that's, that's unfortunately, and fortunately, um, the predictable consequence. There, there's no way to kind of top-down manage um, the effects of democratization. There's a fantastic historical study of the impact of um, the Gutenberg Press on uh, religious movements in, in England called Burning to Read. Um, and it described how the democratization of literacy um, resulted in this upsurge of religious fundamentalist movements um, that were often quite violent uh, and intolerant of others. Um, and, uh, and so there is a, I would, I would venture that any time a new uh, power is introduced en masse, there are going to be massively unpredictable social effects. Um, and the response many have to that is, well, let's go back to the way things were, where um, that power was not available at scale. Um, there were central authorities who maybe, you know, we didn't particularly trust, but at least they kind of kept stability and, and harmony. Um, and this is what we're seeing, you know, happen at, uh, on a top-down level now in China, where the government is saying, you know, our top priority is stability. Um, we do not want the kind of wild market fluctuations that we see in the United States, the unpredictable political atmosphere. Um, we want to ensure continuity because we have a, a central, centrally directed five-year plan that we are working toward as a nation. Um, that is very much antithetical to, um, let's say, the American approach, which um, definitely has a more more bottom up emphasis on generating truth through the violent contestation bottom up um so it's bound to make us uncomfortable but it also has i think raised some really important questions i mean we have people in younger generations digital natives absolutely who are openly asking the question like is fascism a good idea? Like, is is that uh, is communism a valid uh, way of organizing political economy? And they haven't had the same the same history or inheritances of the twentieth century ideological contests, and so they don't have a lot of preconceived notions about what is self evidently good or bad. And that has kind of forced people who maybe are carrying forward the kind of late 20th century liberal consensus to, to answer questions that they're not used to answering, like things that we thought were, was just settled knowledge and we had all agreed on, um, these are now being contested. 
Um, and so I would say that it's challenging us all um, to be better, to be better thinkers, to be better leaders. Um, you know, any lapse in character or integrity by uh, someone in a position of power can and will immediately be weaponized against them through the amplification of social media. So it's holding everyone to account in ways that um, are new, but I suspect uh, ultimately very generative. Uh, there's so many great ideas here in all three of you. Um, and, and first of all, thank you, Steve, for the fantastic question. Um, uh, and if you're new to the forum, um, the kind of question that Steve asked is the kind of questions that people ask. And you can just join him on stage just by asking a question, just by pressing the raise hand button. Happy to beam you up. And the richness, uh, the diversity of responses we just got from Alex, from Emma and Natalie, also show you how awesome the book is. Except for my chapter. My chapter is very different. You can read that if you like. Um, this just covered so much ground. A couple of things came up in the chat. I just wanted to uh, hoist up. Um, uh, we had one person who said, uh, too bad we couldn't figure out how to uh, get everybody some critical thinking before we unleash social media. Um, and then uh, Maria Anderson uh, offers the sage advice. Of course, whether you view social media events as positive or negative certainly depends on the point of view you are looking through, uh, which is quite, quite true. Um, friends, if you'd like to ask other questions, uh, again, the forum stands open for you and for your questions. Uh, and there's one that just came from Annie Epperson, and I want to flash that on the screen so everyone can see it give you all a chance to answer it, and I'm going to read it out loud so you can all hear it. Uh, Annie asks, I'd be interested in hearing what Emma and or Natalie would say about American President Biden's proposed infrastructure investment, i.e., does it open the door to greater government oversight of the internet? Great question, Annie. Yeah, um, actually, so I'm chair of the board of the Texas Blockchain Council, which is a, a trade association that advocates for the blockchain industry in Texas and, and the United States. Um, there was a provision inserted into the infrastructure bill um, sort of at the last minute um, to propose a level of oversight of the cryptocurrency industry that would literally have been impossible to comply with um, under the auspices ostensibly of taxing the cryptocurrency industry as a pay for, um, for the infrastructure bill. Um, however, the, the people who wrote this um, amendment uh, or this provision did, did not very, un very well understand this industry. And so they basically created a new set of reporting requirements that would have required a kind of surveillance, not, not just by the state, but by anyone um using cryptocurrencies so like if you were to send bitcoin to someone you would have to <laughs> fill out a 1099 form for that person so that they would then you know report <laughs> so so people who weren't brokers were basically being treated like brokers everyone from miners to holders of cryptocurrency um this kind of casual o oversight happens all the time in government um it, it's you know elected Politicians are not subject matter experts in in the fields that they legislate. You know, um, ostensibly, their you know lobbying groups are there to educate um, politicians, but then that often results in regulatory capture. Um, so there isn't a very clean or easy solution to the problem of governance. Um, the the state has, um, in all contexts, exhibited a tendency toward uh, greater and greater surveillance. Um, basically, whatever surveillance tools are uh, available to them, they will use. Um, and this is why uh, a whole generation now of young software engineers is basically saying, well, we cannot reform this system politically. We have to, the only way to return any uh, freedom to, to users of digital technologies is to simply build alternative architectures that get such widespread adoption uh, so as to not be killable or co-optable by, by any nation state or coalition of nation states. Um, so. What a passionate and great answer uh, to the fantastic question. Um, Natalie, you were addressed and Emma, you were also invoked. 
How would you respond? How would you add your thoughts? Thank you. And, and actually, this, this plays very nicely um, into what I was talking about or do talk about in my chapter of playing around with this idea of where does the responsibility lie for overcoming huge information challenges? Is it uh, regulation? Is it content moderation? Is it education? And this question of regulation, I was, I was just going back to you know, how do we define it? Um, and I, I took from some legal scholars this definition that it is the intentional use of authority to affect behavior of a different party according to set standards. Now, the problem we have, and I think we've already been circling around this and also in the chat, is that we're always playing catch up. So the, mm. the I'd love to, um, I'm sure we could spar for hours on this, uh, on the um, uh, the comment from one uh, uh, one person in the audience who was saying, you know, too bad we didn't have critical media skills before we had social media. But is it that actually we need slightly different, we need to sort of upskill the critical thinking literacy skills because of the new contexts and new ways of communicating that social media has brought with us. So this, I mean, at, I suppose broad brushstrokes after Natalie's um, very sort of um, precise a response to the question. I think this is a really interesting case study of uh, a government coming in, trying to do that uh, catch up. And it, it's always, it's a struggle with the pace of technology and how it, how quickly it develops. And we've got, you know, there's many of, uh, I suppose, um, an anecdote from the US uh, select committees um, bringing forward, you know, Zuckerberg, whoever it might be, and asking some questions that those in the tech world would think are, let's say, a little naive. Um, so it um, would be a very interesting, I suppose, uh, case study, shall we say, to see develop. I'm just delighted that we have such very, very different perspectives. Um, and uh, that's those give us two very, very different ways into this really, really solid question. Um, so Annie, thank you. Thank you very much for this. Also, I like the way, Natalie and Emma, that you circled back to Steve's initial question to a degree on like, what kind of problem is this? Who does it belong to? Is it a governmental program problem? Is it a business problem? Is it an academic problem? Um, we, have a, we have a question that came in that follows this up uh, by someone who is just barely able to get in, uh, but I don't think his camera will let him uh, handle the chindig right now. This is from Paul Walsh, I'll just read this out loud. Academic freedom is seen as an evil these days, leading good kids astray, exposing young minds to devilish thoughts, deviant thoughts. How do you see the mindset impacting higher ed? Will authoritarian elements use this as leverage to silence the intelligentsia? Who wants to grapple with that? Um, I, I, I might, because I'm... I'm just... <laughs> I have tenure in an academic institution, and the word tenure is normally what determines whether mm -hmm. people feel that they can say what they want to say or whether they can be kicked out. And that seems to be the norm in most countries, or at least in, in this part of the world, I think. Um, I tend to be more interested at the moment in what what is going to be the future of academia um, in terms of misinformation. And, and specifically in terms of how we're grappling with information pre-COVID, <laughs> post-COVID, and, and, and also grappling with really practical things. Um, I, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm supposed to be teaching in three weeks' time and dealing with issues like, you know, do you go into a class and is everybody safe? And is everybody supposed to be socially distanced? I refuse to go and teach with a mask, for instance, and have other people um, with a mask on their face because I just thought that's not the way you do teaching. It's better to do it this way, in a way. You'd be amazed how many people are still harking back exactly and pretending that, you know, we're going to go back to that kind of thing. So dovetailing back to what can you do or what can't you do within academia. I think there's a lot of tension going on right now. You know, what is this artifact called? Especially the higher education institution, because I think that's what, you know, you want us, wanted us to talk about as well, Brian. Um, I'm, I'm involved in a, 
in one of these European projects, which is trying to look at the impact of emerging technologies like blockchain and AI on the future of education. And, and, so, and so we set off, you know, looking at all of this stuff and then COVID happened, happened immediately. And, and what we found out is that you have people who don't know how to use Zoom or, you know, and we didn't pivot into some sort of teaching. We pivot into emergency teaching, for instance. Now grappling with this idea of misinformation, what to do, what not to do with it. The chaos doesn't seem to have been, hasn't, doesn't seem to have got any better. I think we, we you know, we're here we are in, you know, September 2021. It's it's all very uncertain from can I teach, can't I teach, is it safe to teach, what should I teach, how do I teach online, is this performance, do I ask my students to switch on their cameras and, and people saying, and, and you have a diktat from the university, for instance, saying um, it, it's it's a curtsy to your lecturers to so switch on your cameras and people saying, I live in a I live with my two siblings and they're jumping out in the background. I don't want to share my space, for instance. There's all sorts of new norms which are coming in. And what, or, or at the same time, I'm still saying, you know, I, I've had somebody switching on her, her, her phone and I think she was in the supermarket. But, you know, and listening to my lecture, is that a good or bad? Maybe it's good, at least she's listening. So all sorts of new norms, real practical norms that educators, I think, are trying to grapple with. That's my five cents bit. Well, it's a lot to grapple with, and thank you for uh, uh, sharing your story, including having tenure and that powerful shield. Yeah. Emma or Natalie, did you want to add uh, your other perspectives? Natalie, do go ahead if you'd like to. Could you read that question again, Brian? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, this had to do with the question of um, the way that uh, authoritarians can weaponize uh, social media against uh, the intelligentsia. Uh, so mm -hmm. Paul asks, um, academic freedom is seen as an evil these days, uh, leading good kids astray, exposing young minds to deviant thought. How do you see that mindset impacting higher ed? And will authoritarian elements use this leverage to silence the intelligentsia? Yeah, well, first I would say from the perspective of people making that critique of academia, they almost always make that critique in the name of academic freedom, mm. not authoritarianism. In fact, they, they contend that academia currently is an authoritarian institution that manufactures consent and compliance with a particular ideological worldview. So it's really important that we characterize the arguments of people we may disagree with in ways that, you know, that they would actually uh, assent to. Um, the other you know, comment I would make is that the intelligentsia or public intellectuals um, have just as often um, and, and always been tools of authoritarian regimes um, as much as they have been critics of it. You know, one need only to think of, you know, Heidegger's uh, desire to be the, the Geistig leader of Nazi Germany um, on the university front. Um, but, you know, this is true under virtually every ideological political arrangement. And so, you know, what I would propose is that there is no direct correlation between intelligence, um, scholarship, uh, ed or education and political orientation over the long run. Um, the challenge for us as educators is to actually make, make truth um, the ultimate source and, and object of our inquiry. Um, and generally, whenever you do that, whatever political arrangement you happen to find yourself in, you will run afoul of the, um, the structures that demand that education be used as a tool for manufacturing consent, uh, whatever their ideological orientations. And so the scholar who is able to uh, in, inhabit over the long run that position of, of truly making power uncomfortable, but not simply for a kind of base contrarianism, but, but out of a genuine um, seeking of truth. I mean, that is, that is an ideal um, and, and a rare one that we can strive for. Thank you for that. That's a great, that's a great conclusion for that. Uh, Emma, did you want to add more or should we keep going? 
Yeah, a few thoughts, if I may, to, uh, to add on. So uh, just to really, again, circling back to the themes that uh, both Natalie and Alex really highlighted, especially this idea of power and amplification. Um, I think what comes forward for me in this question is this idea of authority and understanding the power and the impact of words. So if, if academic freedom is to see whatever you uh, feel as an opinion in whichever space you choose, then I think that's only just a part that the dissertation for that comes if you have an understanding of the impact of the use of that language in that particular arena. And to give a sort of precise example of this, something I talked about in the digital literacy lab, uh, the educators program that I developed with Alex was this idea of empathetic consumption, this idea that as soon as you put words out into the ether in whatever form that might be, you have to have a, a, an understanding before you hit publish of the impact those words can have, whether that's on someone making a voting choice, someone opting for a vaccine or a cure or, or a, a, a treatment, any ailment it might be. And I think coming back to the context of higher education, one of the elements that really scares me, to be honest, is that it is not standard across a lot of degree programs to take what is normally seen as the reside of the humanities, the ability to pick apart and unpick arguments in the craft of language and take that skill and apply it to whatever information you're tackling. So to, to conclude then, to, for me, academic freedom can only come when it's paired with that knowledge and understanding. And if we are going to lord that in a higher education setting, then we must be equipping and empowering the students we mentor and nurture and want to become upstanding citizens with this skill, ability, knowledge. That sounds uh, almost like a, a total mode for understanding communication and, uh, and uh, perhaps rhetoric in an older sense. Uh, that's fantastic, Emma. And I, I, I have so many questions, but, but all of you have had your questions and, and comments. I will make sure people get a chance to add these. Uh, in the chat, Phil, uh, Phil Katz wants us to think about the assumption that higher education is about the search for truth. Uh, Lisa Durf has uh, her own good suggestions. Uh, and we have a long-term uh, Future Trends Forum uh, participant and author who wants to join us on stage. So let me just bring this gentleman up. Assuming that I don't crash his computer and so doing. Hello, Tom. Hey. So you weren't you weren't responsible for crashing my computer. That was that was entirely uh, my electronic devices. So. Okay. okay. Um, but that's not why we're here. So um, I wanted to ask. I, what I see is one of the major problems with the current information environment is its complexity. And the fact that there are so many layers now that we didn't have before, they were, the, they were always there, but they were well hidden. You know, you, you didn't really care what was going on behind Walter Cronkite. You kind of assumed he was operating with a high level of integrity and ethics, which may or may not have been true. And there were a lot of stories that weren't heard as a consequence. And I think on the whole, this is a, a real plus that's happened in the last decade or so where we started hearing a lot of these voices. I think that's what's driving a lot of this tension, a lot of new things coming out, which is only good for us in a diversity perspective. The concern I have is um, transparency. And to me, I think that's the thing that government should be regulating toward is maximizing transparency. Um, there's you know, if you see a piece of information on Twitter or you see a piece of information on Facebook or whatever, you don't know if that came from Aunt Emma or Yuri in Odessa. And so, you know, when we operated within the context of an academic scholarly world, we have very strong um, information chains where we cite things and you go back. And if you don't do that, you get smacked and so on and so forth. There's a there's a process there. How do we build that into a much broader system of information? That's my question. 
huge question. <laughs> I give the easy question. <laughs> Just to clarify, are you asking, you know, how how we can more accurately determine the identities of people making claims online? Yeah. Well, that's part of it, but just in general, the the, the provenance of information. I mean, so when you you know write a scholarly book, you can figure out the provenance of information through your citations. And uh, but how do we do that in a much more systemic using technology? in a much more systemic uh, way? And can government play a role in that? I think that's where the regulation should come in, to be honest. Yeah, we, we, we're quite heavy on regulation in Europe, you know, with all this GDPR stuff and things like that. That's the way right. this, this kind of amoeba called the EU tries to do things. And that's why when we look across the pond, which is where all the evil is coming from, of course, you know, Google, and, and, you know, Facebooks and all the other platforms, there's always, this tension yeah like, like natalie i was i was sensing this undercurrent of identity and in a way it, it almost like reminds me of the old what 1994 thing you know on the internet nobody knows you're a dog and and, <laughs> and, 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 and for a long time we thought that was great I thought, I thought it was great i could be a dog online or whatever it is um, um and now it's kind of pivoted the the other way and, and at the same time i was thinking you know I, I was watching, I started watching on Netflix. I don't know if you guys have seen this thing. It's like how to how to sell drugs online or whatever it's called. I can't remember. It's got a very long title. I, if, if I could get everybody to watch it, because it's a really crash course on Gen Z and and this whole thing about both performance, but also identity and, and how we're using social media or misusing social media and, and our misunderstandings of it and this huge generational divide. I mean, whenever whenever I teach people, it seems like every single year I teach, people look down on the previous year and say, oh, well, you know, this lot coming up are really weird. They're really doing some weird shit. And I think as educators, we're, we're all really trying to grapple what the hell is going on. So then you have these institutions like the EU was regulated and let's find people. On the other side, you have the platform saying this is all great clickbait and all the algorithms. We don't know how it works anyway, which I think is lack of transparency we're talking about. And we kind of call it in between. But I also sense that there is this maybe pushback in the same way all of us who used to read Perry Barlow and say this is what, yeah. how, what the words, that, that there is a sense that maybe, now whether we're going to grasp to decentralization and the blockchain and, 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 and self-sovereign identities and other, other ways of, of getting back to truth, truth matters, experts matter, maybe if that's what we think education is all about. But I think I, I do sense there's a bit of a, a, a pushback, but at the same time, I, going back to education, I just think this whole COVID stuff, which is happening is complicating matters even even more you know i mean i live in a country where 90 percent of people have got vaccinated for instance okay and then i don't know what's happening in dallas natalie you know and about so again truths on truths on basic things and social media is not helping helping from that point of view i guess or maybe it does I guess Emma and Natalie, they give you a chance to uh, to respond, and especially to make Alex feel even older. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Go ahead, Emma. Sure. Well, uh, thank you so much for the question, Tom. And, and I, I think you know you underline a really huge issue is this idea that source authority is just not really understood outside of our daily bread and butter, shall we say? Mm -hmm. um, and I, just to pick up what was going on in the chat, someone uh, was talking, well, bringing up a case study of Wikipedia. For a long time, we said, don't use Wikipedia. Um, you know, find an authoritative source, but we didn't define, and again, it, coming back to where we started, definition and presentation to engage the stakeholders, whoever they might, may be. Well, if you didn't define what we meant by authority, well, Wikipedia being a peer reviewed resource, Okay, yes, we know there's, uh, there, there are still falsities peddled there. Um, but what we did was we handicapped that development of using different sources across the internet, developing that lateral reading, developing that critical eye when you're coming to sources. So, um, you know, and the, it, just the magnitude of the, of the problem, I think, uh, is in, indicated in, for example, in the UK, we 
have a huge uh, booming tutoring industry and the essay writing mills. And at many a time has someone come and knocked on my door and offered an exit sum to write an essay, whatever it might be, um, just to flag off, uh, you know, obviously I uh, haven't done that. Um, but, the, the, you know, apart from academic integrity and uh, planning my early retirement, but for me, the problem is not that the students of any age come and try and find someone to write their dissertations for them, is that they, they have been uh, disempowered with the skills to undertake such activities. But then to come back to what you were saying, Tom, about, you know, okay, that's one thing, ensuring that someone undertakes a rigorous degree program has these skills, but what do we do to bring it outside of the so-called ivory towers? Um, well, I think we've got to, we all have to work harder to show and bring out different examples of where not having this ability to critique language, understand craft and the cunningness of craft um, is around us every day. I mean, we, we're speaking at a really, um, I suppose, good moment for this. We have the Theranos trial starting this week. I mean, uh -huh. the, the words of Elizabeth Holmes, who, who fooled many a Silicon Valley investor, and journalist, et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. um, we have, you know, the one coin crypto to come to uh, sort of uh, Natalie's bread and butter, the one coin cryptocurrency, the people who uh, sold their life, you know, given up their livelihoods to invest in, uh, um, uh, well, a, a con, right? Um, it, we could talk about Brexit. We could talk about so many different examples. Um, and yet these are not ushered forth in the service of underlining what we mean by authority and what it means when you don't understand what authority is and how you can discern it. Um, I, and to just finally pick up on Alex's optimism, I think there is a sense that there's the next wave of tools, digital tools that are promoting this, such as hypothesis.is, mm -hmm. you know, this annotation tool online, um, and, and others of a similar ilk. So uh, it, there are lots of challenges, um, but to bring in that spark of optimism and, and hand over to, to Natalie. We, we need Xanadu from uh, Ted Nelson, right? That would solve all these problems, right? <laughs> Ted never made it work, but please, Natalie. You know, He's still working on it. He's still working on it. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Tom, to answer your question, um, you know, I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think there's ever going to be um, a, a citation trail behind guys who post Pepe memes, you know, on, on Reddit. No, and I, I, don't, um, I don't think that's, that's but, the case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But to what, so, to what extent can we regulate an openness so we can see those trails of information more clearly than we currently do? Because right now we're only seeing the front of those, in, uh, you know, okay, we're going to take this uh, cow deworming medication to cure COVID. Where the hell did that come from, right? right? I should be able to work my way backwards if I'm just a normal person and figure well, the, that out, right? Yeah, and in some cases you you can through um, doing yeah. things like language analysis and tracking the emergence of a term, it's, but it's hard. uptake, uh, but yeah. it's a lot of work. And yeah. the reality is, you know, as Foucault has, has taught us, culture is mimetic. Um, mm -hmm. So there is no author, so to speak, to whom we can trace a final attribution of, say, a conspiracy theory. Um, and so the, the only real uh, way to, say, prevent you know, the spread of misinformation is cultivation of not just um, you know, the capacity for critical thinking, but the character of people inhabiting human societies. Um, it takes, it takes uh, character traits like humility, for example, to be, be willing to admit what you don't know. It takes character traits like fortitude to be able to hold to a position in the face of popular outrage. It takes character traits like um, generosity to avoid, you know, l jumping on to uh, a pitchfork mob who's canceling someone over a misunderstanding. And it's, it's what we're seeing now is actually the amplification of a kind of, of weaknesses of character that are being used as attack vectors across every human society. 
I, I have to pause this right now with, with incredible regret um, because we are almost out of time. Uh, Tom, as usual, you ask a deep question, and I'm glad you did. And let's end on an optimistic note. We're all screwed because we're human. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've got a better optimistic note. I've got a better note. Here's my, here's my request, and thank you, Tom. My, my request is this. Uh, in under one minute, can each of you give us marching orders for higher education to what we should do uh, in order to best grapple with this problem? Um, you know, should we teach uh, some form of backtracing and origin, as Tom suggested? Uh, should we come up with a blockchain-based verification system? Should we teach more digital literacy? What is what would you advise us to do? Uh, and let's uh, let's let's work backwards. Uh, let's start off with uh, Natalie. What would you advise us to do in less than a minute? Less than a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my view is that the purpose of higher education is. Uh, ultimately to craft the character of the residents of, of the future society. And mm. so my what I would encourage educators to do is precisely to build those traits of character that are going to give students the um, independence of mind um, and pro-social inclinations that will help them navigate a world full of information-based predation and warfare that they're already amidst. Thank you. So character formation for this chaotic world. Thank you, Natalie. Over to you, Emma, in Cyprus, what would you advise us to do? Well, to pick up on Natalie's point of taking her holistic view, and I love what you say, Natalie, about focusing on character. I've been thinking quite a lot in the last few days about what, again, this purpose of the university in a time when other disruptors are challenging the conventional institution. And for me, coming back to the, even let's say, looking back to the early modern period where cross-disciplinarity, the polymath, this looking across the disciplinary boundaries was so important. So for me, and certainly part of my uh, work and the activism in this space is really identifying common languages between different disciplines and, and encouraging that dialogue. If we are to prepare upstanding so-called 21st century citizens, then we, we surely must be doing this. Lovely. Thank you. And thank you for reaching back to the early modern period uh, to, to get us thinking. I'm going to put in something in the chat for that. Thank you, Emma. And uh, back to Malta. Alex, what would you recommend that the University of Malta and the rest of us do? Uh, well, the first thing the University of Malta should do is stop behaving like it's a bricks and mortar uh, institution and, oh. and, and focus on uh, the, the real business of, of co-learning. I would say, because I think everybody can learn from each other. And I learn more from my students sometimes, I suspect that they learn from me. Um, I'll, I'll pick up from what Emma is, is saying. Um, we set up the TreeCL Foundation as an interdisciplinary foundation, um, break down the silos, break down the silos between faculties, um, use the new media, if that's what it is, for people to get scared together. Um, you know, and the old principle of weak ties and the strength of weak ties still works. It doesn't just have to work as LinkedIn. It can happen in many other forms. Uh, don't trust the Zuckerberg and company. So yeah, maybe use Signal instead of WhatsApp as a basic things. And, and question what you see on the screen while at the same time get better at being on the screen, whether you're age 10 or 90, I think, because the screen is the way we're going to be navigating life I think for a while, whether the screen is this small or this big or whatever it is, whether we have it in our pocket and we think it's listening to us or whether we're using it to broadcast our lives and sharing our holiday or, you know, saying happy birthday to your aging father, I guess. Yeah. Beautiful, Alex. Uh, all, all three of you, thank you so much. This has been so rich. Uh, I'm, I feel privileged to have been able to borrow you for this one hour of time. Um, Alex, Emma, Natalie, each of you have given us so much to chew on. Uh, the world needs to hear more of this kind of thinking. Um, Alex, thank you for assembling uh, the book. Everybody, you should grab a copy however you can. Uh, Alex, if you can think of it in the chat box, tell us the Netflix documentary about uh, how to buy crack online or whatever you had in mind. Um, yeah. yeah. Or, uh, yeah. 
it's streaming on Netflix right now. I'm not suggesting just, just put it in the chat. Time. Yeah, but I'll, I'll find it somewhere. But it's 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 this very how, popular at the moment. This is how memes start. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in the meantime, uh, all three of you, please, uh, wherever you are on the surface of the earth, please take care. Keep up the great work, and we're looking forward to seeing everything you do next. Thank you so much, Brian. It's a pleasure. Our pleasure. But don't Bye, go away. From, don't go away yet. I have to tell you what's happening next in the future transform. We have a whole bunch of stuff coming up, and I want to make sure that you hear about it. Um, and the, while I'm doing this, let me thank you all for really, really great questions. And you saw how they provoke wonderful answers. Uh, so looking ahead, we next week, we're actually looking into open access and scholarly publication, a topic that came up in the chat quite a bit. We have sessions on STEM and equity, rethinking learning, rethinking the university, and also introducing a new idea of literacy called Ecomedia. If you'd like to learn more, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. If you want to keep talking about this, should the government or what role should the government play in regulation? And which government, the European Union or the United States? Is this up to blockchain? Is this something the individual should be responsible for? Please keep the conversation going. You can use the hashtag FTTE. You can tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or tweet at the Shindig Events hashtag, or follow us on the blog, brianalexander.org. And if you want to go back into the past and look at some of our previous sessions when we've been talking about information issues, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive for more. And in the meantime, keep thinking about these issues. The fall semester is just starting up. These are definitely of the moment. We'd love to hear from everybody, but also I'd like to wish all of you well. Please take care, stay safe, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>